chorus and I'll we'll cut out the instruments. I'll say, let's do it one more time. Yeah.
and welcome to Matthew Baptist Church. Let's all stand and we'll sing up this first hymn, hymn 343, At the Cross. This is a great hymn. Sing it out on that first. Alas, and did my Savior
Aren't you glad that it's enough that Jesus died for us? Amen. Let's all stand for this next hymn. Hymn 337. I rest my hand.
singing. Good morning. Good to see you at Mount View Baptist Church today on this beautiful Palm Sunday. A little bit chilly, uh, not the spring maybe that we were expecting, but hopefully we'll get it soon. But I'm thankful we're not up north. They got hammered with snow, and I know some friends that got a half a foot of snow, and uh, it was a little bit messy yesterday, but we at least uh, were steered clear of that. But it is so good to see you in church this morning. We're so thankful that you're here, and uh, we're looking forward to what the Lord has for us this morning. And I hope your heart is prepared. I hope you prayed and asked God to speak to you today. And the Lord is doing some great things here. We've had just a jam-packed weekend. First, I want to start and just thank all the guys that helped make food and everyone that helped make food yesterday for the men's Bible study. And uh, I know it's not a contest or anything, but we did have one more person than the ladies had. So I just, just wanted to throw that out there. It's not a contest. I know it's not a contest. I know we're not keeping track. And uh, somebody texted me, Brother Copeland, and said, you can't count Brother Copeland. And I said, yeah, I can. He's the man. He was there with us. So we're counting you, all right? So uh, we had one more. We had 30 guys yesterday. And so thank you guys for being there. And if you couldn't make it, please come out next month. These Bible studies are just a great opportunity to fellowship, to get around each other. We had just a great time of prayer yesterday, some testimony time. And uh, please come out to these. I know, I know we're busy. We have busy schedules. But these Bible studies are very important. And the ladies' Bible study is coming up on April 6th. Sixth, and then our next study will be on April 27th. Well, if you do see some people walking slowly this morning or hobbling a little bit, we had a great night ice skating last night. Had a good group. I think we had 60 to 70 total there from our church and uh, just had a great time. No, no major injuries to report, so that's always a good thing, or not that I know of. Um, but we appreciate all those that came, Brother Jim helping us organize, and uh, just a great time of fellowship together. So thank you for being there, church, and we had, we had a lot of fun last night. Well, a couple just quick announcements this morning. Next Sunday is Easter. Easter, and so we will have an 8.30 service, 10 o'clock Sunday school, 11 a.m. service, and no evening service. So 8.30 and 11. The majority of the music, the choir will be singing at 11, just so you know, but we will have music and some special things in the 8.30 as well, um, but just so you are aware of that day. Um, but let's just do our best to invite people. We have Easter cards, and we've got a big stack back there. Make sure you grab some of these and uh, grab one and invite people to come to church for Easter, and make sure you bring someone with you. Invite family members, neighbors, co-workers, a great opportunity to invite someone to church. And we have some special things going on for the kids. We are doing a candy scramble. And if you don't know what that is, instead of taking all the time to stuff the candy in eggs, we just dump a bunch of candy on a field and let the kids go at it. So it's, it's great. And uh, we're doing that for a candy scramble for Easter. I remember years, just hours and hours of eggs, and we're like, why are we doing this? Well, this is so much time, and uh, they, no one, you don't know what to do with the Easter eggs afterwards anyways, you know? So uh, we could appreciate any more candy to be brought in. We have a good amount in the office, but I still think we need some more, so we need to, we need to make sure we really sugar the kids up before we send them home next week. So if you're able to donate some more, we'd appreciate it, and that can be brought right to the office. The next season, Souls Ministry, uh, their activity is going to be on April 14th, and this is 55 and older. This will be again at the Ludlow Mills, and they had just a great fellowship a few weeks ago, so please be a part of this, and if you have any questions, see Brother Gary or Miss Libby, but we're excited about this ministry. Our missions conference is coming up at the end of April, April 27th and 28th, and it will be Saturday and Sunday. So Saturday night, we'll have our international supper here at the church at 4.30, a service that night, and then all day Sunday. So please make plans to come out for our missions conference, and we're excited about that. And then one other announcement, Mother's Day is not that far away. I know some of these, these days just seem way down the road, but they're not too far away. We want to start planning, and we're going to do something special this year. We're doing a Mother's Day brunch, and it's going to be at 9.30, and what we'd like to do, it's going to be over in the fellowship hall, and we're going to have different stations set up. So we'll have an omelet station, and we'll have a pancake station, and maybe bacon and eggs, and sorry if I'm making you hungry. Uh, we'll, we'll have a few different stations set up. Of course, a coffee station. That's already there. Um, but we'll have different stations set up. So if you have any ideas about that, or guys, if you would like to be a part, 
and uh, help man one of those stations, please let me know. We'll kind of start getting that planned, and we'll just have a special uh, morning there. All, of, all the ladies, mothers and daughters are all welcome to that, and we'll do that on Mother's Day, and uh, we'll look forward to um, just a special day. We are planning a baptism Sunday very soon, so please do see me if you would like to get baptized. We'd love to get you on the list, and we would love to meet with you. And also, we're praying about starting a discipleship class, and I believe this will be on Mondays. We're, we're trying to just get some of the details together, but if you're interested in being a part of that, please do let me know. If you could please pray for our missionaries of the week, we have Close Country E, and we also have Jason and Jody Kendrick, the tent ministry. And they have um, their most recent prayer letter um, that they gave us. And also they just sent us a, a message uh, praying for upcoming meetings, for God's power. And um, they're looking for something for, to help their travel. And so they did ask prayer for that. And they have been in 11 states and in more than 23 churches um, during this last time period. And so just praising the Lord for his traveling mercies and uh, many just things that they're praising the Lord for. So make sure you get a chance to, to read that. If you would like to be a part of the missions letters, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board, and you can sign up to get the emails. We appreciate Yvonne doing that, and I remembered. I remember to give the announcement, and, uh, and uh, we would love to get you on that list, and so you can get the, uh, get the, the, the updates from the missionaries who so want to pray. And, and I encourage you to be a part of Faith Promise Giving and be a part of missions, what the Lord is doing uh, all around the world, and it, it's, it's so encouraging to read and see these updates. And so if you like those emails, you can sign up on the back bulletin board. Well, it is such a, a blessing to have the Copelands with us this morning. And it says Pastor Kurt Copeland and his wife, Christy, and they're here with us this morning. And I uh, heard just Sunday school went great for the ladies. And we had Brother Copeland next door. And we're looking forward to having um, him preach for us in just a little bit. But before we do that, we have just a couple more announcements. Brother Chad? I'm wondering if there, is there is anybody celebrating a birthday? Anybody celebrating a birthday around this? Oh, Adam? Adam, happy birthday. You got called out again, fingers pointing. Yep. Miss Savine, happy birthday to you as well. Any other? Oh, Brian. Brian Apple, happy birthday. He's already standing. He's ready. He's going to come up for offering, so there we go. Well, uh, Savine and then Adam, if you'd stand, happy birthday to these. Let's sing it out. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Man, let's give him a hand. Happy birthday. What about wedding anniversaries? Is there a couple celebrating a wedding, wedding anniversary? Around? No? Okay, well, we'll have our men come forward at this time for this morning's offering. You know, every time I hear the, uh, the missionaries of the week, and one of them is a closed country, I just think of how blessed we are. As Americans, as, as people living here, that's a great blessing. Just that alone, to be able to worship freely, to be able to come and worship God. Uh, anytime we want. Uh, so let's think of that as we uh, uh, prepare for this morning's offering. Brother Jeff LaRoche, if you could please pray over the offering. God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just give you thanks and praise, especially for being able to worship you in a free country, Lord. Um, you truly are blessed, Lord, and we are uh, forever indebted to you. So let us uh, not only give back a portion to uh, the church to continue to move and continue to support those who are missionaries, let us always remember that our missionary field is right outside these doors, especially at this time. Let us go forth and, and proclaim the good news and get some more people in here to, to serve the church with and help them get some, some uh, souls saved to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. 
A thousand sparkling stars upon the midnight summer sky. The majesty and wonder of the ocean's endless tide. And the more I see, the more I can't explain how the one who set the world in place could even know my name. And I'm amazed, I'm so amazed How great you are, how small I am How awesome is your mighty hand And I am captured by the wonder of it all And I will offer all my praise With all my heart for all my days how great you are, how great you are. A million snowflakes gently fall, yet no two are the same. And colors fill the canvas, of the seasons as they change and everywhere I look I see your head how you will love someone like me I'll never understand and I'm amazed I'm so amazed how great you are, how small I am, how awesome is your mighty hand. And I am captured by the wonder of it all. And I will offer all my praise with all my heart for all my days. How great you are, how great you are. How great you are, how awesome is your mighty hand, and I am captured by the wonder of it all, and I will offer all, with all my heart for all my days, how great you are, how great you are. How great you are, how great you are. Amen. We serve a great God. Thank you so much for that song. We appreciate that this morning. Great singing this morning, church, and we're excited to get into the preaching of God's Word. I was a young man at Bible college, and I remember hearing Brother Copeland come preach at the Bible college I went to, and so um, that means he's old. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and, uh, but I remember the Lord just really using that message at Bible college, and then I went to another Bible college, and he preached at that one, too, and I'm thinking, this guy's everywhere. And uh, we came here, and I remember thinking, as, as you put together youth events and, and, and conferences. We love to, you know, there's people that just kind of stand out. We had you uh, years ago come speak to our young people, and then just, I think, a couple years ago, and uh, you've just been such a blessing to me, my wife. Um, we've enjoyed just getting to know you folks. You've been a great example, and so we're honored, church, to have the Copelands with us this morning, and he'll be preaching this morning and tonight for us, and so, brother, why don't you come and share with us what God lays on your heart? Thank you, Pastor Mary. God bless you. Well, it's good to see you this morning, Mountain View Baptist Church. And I, by the way, I don't know who's guests and who's home folks, so I'll, I'll treat everyone the same here today. And if you are a guest, let me just encourage you. Uh, I, my cup is running over this morning. Uh, I am encouraged. This is, I, I have loved this morning's service. And, uh, and I may mess it up from here on out, but I've loved it up to this point. And uh, the singing has been fantastic. And uh, literally, start to finish, from congregational singing uh, to the choir to, to uh, the special we just heard, man, Jesus Christ's name has been lifted up. E even the offertory that was played, that was fantastic. I, 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 my, I, I'm encouraged. I, I mean that. Uh, I'm also a little confused, so help me out here. 
I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. That's the south. I do have shoes on today, just in case you wonder. And uh, down south, we don't always wear them, but I'm wearing them today. But pastor got up and announced that he said that they got snow up north. I thought I was up north. This isn't the north. I'm still trying to figure this out. Y'all, y'all have, conf- y'all have, con- y'all have not down here confused me now. I don't throw on some southern accent, but uh, it is a joy to be at Mountain View Baptist Church, and I've always enjoyed coming here. I love the spirit of this place, and uh, I, I think it's my third or, or so time being here, and I, I'm just thrilled, and uh, we're thankful for the accommodations you've gotten for us, and the, uh, all the kindness. Got, I enjoyed uh, ice skating last night, and uh, it was, it, we had just had a great time. The men's meeting, not to rub it in, ladies, but the men rule, ladies drool, <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and he won't challenge you like it's a competition, but I will. I'm leaving. And uh, I, see, just, well, I, I want to hear the report next ladies' meeting. I want to know that the men are still whooping the women. I don't know if I should say it quite that way. That's, that the men rule. That's what I should say. I don't know. I, let me just move on to the message here. I'm getting myself in trouble. And uh, it is such a joy to be here. And, and uh I enjoyed Sunday school this morning, too, and uh, I, I hear the, the, the ladies' teacher did a fantastic job. I'm not surprised by that. Uh, men's meeting, we just enjoyed breakfast and telling stories is all we did, and uh, I, I'm just kidding. I, I want to encourage, if you don't come to a Sunday school class, uh, take the time to come. It, it's worth it. It really is, and, and you may say, well, what are they going to tell me I don't already know, and you may already know it all. I, I, you may already know it all, uh, but the fellowship is off, awesome. And uh, enjoying sitting down and, and, and talking and, and uh, rubbing shoulders with people uh, that you wouldn't, you know, you come into a service like this and literally you come in, you sit down, you smile, <laughs> you smile, and, and you enjoy a service, you sing a song or two, but there's really not any fellowship time. And, you know, we say our last amen, we're out the door, we're gone, and really what we've done is we've punched our clock, we've punched the time, the time clock. And we've been in, we've done our thing. I enjoyed walking through and seeing people over here at the, at the goodies and uh, standing there talking. I couldn't even get up to the goodies because some of y'all were in the way talking. And, and uh, I wasn't going to have any anyway. But I, I love the fellowship. That's a sign of a healthy group of people uh, enjoying talking, enjoying each other. And, and uh, I didn't hear anyone say today, oh, you're sitting in my seat. I didn't hear anyone say that. And that's a good thing. By the way, if someone did sit in your seat, it's okay. There's more room. And uh, there, you can find another seat, and, and it's okay. But I love the fellowship. And thank you. Thank you for allowing my wife and I to have a part in that today. And uh, it's been a joy being here already. Looking forward to tonight. And I hope you come back tonight. You say, well, I don't normally come to Sunday night. Well, tonight, make an exception. And uh, come back, and we'll have a good old time together in the service tonight. And uh, John, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter number 4 this, this morning. 1 John, not to be confused with John chapter 4. And uh, 1 John chapter 4. Go to the book. It's a hard one to find. It really is. If you go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and go back into the Bible just two or three pages, you'll find 1 John. And uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. But we're going to go to 1 John chapter number 4 this morning. I I think it's important as I look at this passage of Scripture just real quickly here that this passage of Scripture is not written to the lost world. This passage of Scripture is written to Christians. Uh, And that's important to understand in this passage. Um, There are some verses in here that might confuse uh, us if we don't understand he's writing to Christians, not to the lost. And as we look at 1 John chapter number 4, I want to take you to 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 9. Powerful passage of Scripture. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 9. The Bible says this, 1 John 4, 9. In this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, get this, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. I look at these two verses of Scripture and I learn something Very, very encouraging this morning. 
I learned the aspect that God loves. I know that's something we all know. We, we hear this. We talk about this. By the way, we're in church. We hear this kind of talk all the time in church. But for just this morning, will you let it sink in just a little bit? God Almighty, the creator of the universe, loves us. I grew up with three older brothers. And uh, I, I'm the youngest of four boys. My oldest brother's name is Carrie. I say this everywhere I go. His name is Carrie. That's a girl's name. And I'm okay saying, by the way, if you're a man here and your name's one of these names, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about my brothers. Please don't beat me up after the service. But uh, I love giving my brothers a hard time. I, I really do. My oldest brother's name is Carrie. And I laugh to this day. He's 56 years old or so, 50, 57 years old. And I love to say, he's got a girl's name. And I love to rub it in. And uh, my second brother's name, I'm not making this up. These are, I'm not just doing this to be mean. I'm just telling you, this is the, they're God-given, they're not God-given. These are my parents' given's name. I don't think God had anything to do with naming my brothers. And my second brother's name, his name is Kelly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I, to me, I just have a big old time making fun of my brothers. I really do. And that's a girl's name. And my third brother's name, now I understand this is probably more a guy's name than a girl's name. And, uh, but in, in the Copeland home, this is definitely a girl's name, and it's Corey, and uh, Corey is my third brother's name, and then my name is Kurt. I'm the only man in the family, <laughs> and uh, I remember I would tease my brothers about that when I was, when I was little, and, and my brothers, you can imagine, big brothers, little punk brother, little kid brother, I would say something like, you got a girl's name, and my brothers would torture me. I don't know why. But they would torture me. My brothers would sit on my stomach. They would torture me, hold my hands to the ground, and they would, they would pick on me. And uh, I remember crying out, Mom, help, Mom, C tears running down my face into my ears, laying on my back. I couldn't get them off of me. I couldn't fight them off of me. I, I remember one time my brothers came to me, and they said this. Uh, they said, Kurt, just so you know, you're not really our brother. I was just a little, maybe you all had some siblings similar. And my brother, you're not really our brother. And by the way, I'm not opposed. I love this. They would say you're adopted. By the way, I'm thankful I am adopted. I'm adopted by Jesus Christ. I'm part of God's family by adoption. But they didn't mean it that way. They, they were saying you're not really our brother. And I remember, I'd cry. I was five years old. I'd cry. I'd go running into mom's room. Mom, mom, am I really adopted? I'm, are you really my mom? I'm crying. And then she'd say, oh, you're my son. You're, look at you. You're obviously my son. We, I look just like my mom. You're obviously my son. There's no question you're my And I'd go back into the room. I am your brother. You're stuck with me. I'm your brother. You have girls' names I take off running. <laughs> One day my brother said this. Do you remember, those of you my age and older, you remember, you remember the, when you'd go to the grocery store and you'd get a cereal box and you didn't buy the cereal based on the, the health content of the box? As a matter of fact, I don't think they printed that on the box back then. I remember you always looked at the great picture on the front and then I always looked for this. I looked for the box that had the toy listed on the box. Remember those good old days? And uh, we'd buy the cereal box with the biggest toy in there, the best toy in there. And all of us as boys, we had the privilege of picking out what, what cereal box we wanted or, or, what, or generally speaking, it was one cereal box and we fought over the toy. And we'd run home and, and literally we'd tear that box open. We'd get one of the mixing bowls out. We'd pour the cereal into the mixing bowl, waiting for the toy to flop out. And the first one that grabbed it got the toy. And, and then we had new rules in the house like... No longer can you dig for the toy in the cereal box. No longer, you have to wait until it naturally falls out of the boxes. Well, we would shake it to make it naturally fall out, and I would scoot the bag over a little bit. I, I remember my brothers coming to me one day, and they said, Kurt, you're not really our brother. You're a snap-together toy from Cheerios. And I thought, what are you talking about? They said, you know the toys we get out of the cereal box? Years ago, you were one of those toys, and we pulled you out of that box, and we snapped you together, and poof, there you are, and I was dumb enough to believe it. 
I remember crying, I am not a snap together toy. That is not, I'm not a snap together. I went crying into my mom's room. Mom, I'm really, I'm not a snap together toy. Am I? Please tell me I'm not. And my mom looked at me, literally didn't crack a smile, nothing. She said, what's wrong with that, Kurt? Ah, I went running to my bedroom, crying on my bed. It was years later I finally learned I'm not a snap together toy from Kellogg's or from Cheerios. You know, you ever, you ever had those times in your life where you didn't feel loved? You ever had those times in your life where you, I went running from my mom's room that day into my bedroom, laid on the bed, and I thought, no one loves me. Who in the world am I? I'm a snap together toy from Cheerios. You ever had those times you didn't feel like anyone loved you? You ever had those times where you, you know, you, 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 as a, as a kid growing up, you think my mom doesn't care, my, my dad doesn't care, I, no one loves me, everyone hates me, I think I'll eat some worms. You know, Alexander and the Terrible Horrible, no good, very bad day. You know, you ever had those times where you, you go to work and no one talks to you at work? You come home and you sit down on the chair and, sir, your wife burnt your food. Well, she doesn't love me. She gave me, she, my wife had the audacity one day, I don't like broccoli. When we were first married, she had the audacity to put broccoli in my hamburger helper. <laughs> we were in our first six months of marriage. And she, she, I don't know if she pureed it. She did something, made it like really, really little teeny tiny pieces. And she put it in my hamburger helper. I remember I took the first bite and I was like, what is, what is, and I started digging in my hamburger helper. You put broccoli in my food. You know I don't like broccoli. You know. And, and sometimes, by the way, I still felt like I was loved. And now I like broccoli. She's converted me, I guess. <laughs> Truth is, sometimes in, in real life, we feel like we're not loved. You, you remember standing at the altar, sir, with that bride? She just stole your heart. You remember? No, go ahead and act like you remember. Some of y'all look at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> remember when you saw that, that lady you call your wife? Remember when you saw her for the first time? And you were like, hubba hubba. <laughs> I know some of you are like, I don't remember that. And your wife right now is elbowing you. <laughs> you do remember. Come on, think harder. And you thought you'd live happily ever after? You thought there'd never be an... I remember when we got married. It was January 1st, 1994. We just celebrated 30 years. We got married on January 1st. That way I'd never forget. <laughs> I remember standing there thinking, we'll never say goodbye. We'll have the happiest... Her, she's, we're going to live happily ever after from now on. There will never be an argument. There will n it was our honeymoon. And we had a good argument on our honeymoon. Like, what am I thinking? I'm an idiot. You, you, we, we, sometimes we, we have this idea that, that we'll never have a problem. We'll never, everything's going to be grand. And, and sometimes we, we lay on the bed at night. We think, man, does anyone even know I'm here? Does anyone even care? Some of you, and I'm not trying to open wounds. Some of you, you buried your loved one. You're lonely. You know, God brought me to this passage of Scripture in 1 John today for this purpose. To brag on the love of God. No matter how lonely you are. No matter the trouble you face. No matter the problem in life. God loves you. The Bible says this in our passage of Scripture. In this was manifest the love of God. What does it mean? What is the word manifested? What, what is, that, that word literally means demonstrated or displayed. In this was displayed or given or shown to us the love of God. How did God show us that love? He sent, the Bible says, because that God sent his only begotten son, uh, his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, I stop and think about the love that God had for me. I, I go all the way back to John chapter number 3. You remember the conversation in John chapter number 3 between a, a, a very religious man named Nicodemus? 
and, and the, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. A, a real literal conversation between a very religious man and the Son of God. John chapter 3. And in that conversation, Nicodemus came to Jesus late at night, literally in, in hiding so that none of his cohorts, any of the people in the church knew that he was going to see Jesus. And here he comes to Jesus by night and he says, Master, we know you come from God. No man can do the works I do, but, but rather you come from God. We know. Can we, how can we know we're going to heaven? That's literally the course of the conversation. A very religious man looking at Jesus Christ saying, how can I go to heaven? What a question. By the way, you know what I found as we travel in evangelism across this nation? People are still asking the same question. How can I know I'm going to heaven? And here's a religious man in John chapter number 3. And Jesus looks at this religious man and he says this. Hey, hey, sir, Nicodemus, it's not by your religious actions. It's not by your church attendance. I just said that and we're all attending church on a Sunday morning. By the way, I'm not minimizing attending church. But what I am saying is attending church doesn't take anyone to heaven. Hey, it's not, Pastor, you just announced about a baptism Sunday coming up. Praise the Lord for that. I'm guessing the baptistry is right there. Amen. Not anymore. Okay, I don't want to step back too far on it and fall in. And uh, it would be cold water today, I suppose. But the truth is, is baptism doesn't save anyone. Amen. I'm not on my way to heaven because I got baptized as a young child. I'm on my way to heaven the same way that Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus. Here's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, marvel not that I say unto you, ye must be born again. Born again. What's that mean? I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. We're, we're the south. Down there they say it this way. You must be born again. <laughs> born again. I don't even know if that's even proper. I got saved. I got born again when I was 10 years old. I was sitting in a small church in Mattoon, Illinois, named Emmanuel Baptist Church. I was on the third row back, sir, right where you're sitting. There were 14 total people in the church that night. It's a big church. Seven of them had the last name Amstutz. That was my pastor's name. That tells you how big the church was. It was a little old small church. I was sitting on that, that third row back in that service as Pastor Amstutz preached that Sunday morning. And as he preached that Sunday morning, I, I, I wasn't listening to a thing he said that Sunday morning. As 10 years old, all I could think about was this. If I died right now, I'll spend eternity in a place called hell. That's true. And I was scared to death. I didn't want to die and go to a place called hell. Here I sat there that evening, and, and as the pastor preached, my little 10-year-old brain kept rolling. I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to die and go to hell. I'm scared to death. I, I don't want to die. My brothers torture me every day. They could kill me any day. I don't want to die and go to hell. And as he preached that night, this thought kept going through my mind. I, I don't want to die and go to hell, but I know I have a God in heaven who loves me. I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve the goodness of God. But I have a God in heaven who loves me. Yes. Amen. And the preacher finished preaching that night, and he stepped down. He stood right here in front of the Lord's Supper table. And as he stood there, he just said this. It was literally 14 people. He didn't normally give an invitation on those evening services because it was just basically his. He could have preached, children, obey your parents and the Lord to his children. And he would have had a great invitation, you know. Amen. But he sat there and he said this. He said, folks, I don't know why. And I don't normally give an invitation on these evening services. But tonight I feel like God wants me to give an invitation. Amen. And I sat there and it was like God took a two by four. Popped me in the back of the head. I said, Copeland, this one's for you. God said, I love you. Trust me. You see, we, we are celebrating Easter uh, next week. Easter has really nothing to do with Easter bunnies or eggs or all that stuff. And all, that's all fine and dandy. We celebrate Easter because Jesus came up from the grave. Yes, he, he arose. Amen. He's alive. Amen. And today I'm on my way to heaven, not because I'm a preacher. Amen. Matter of fact, there might be preachers who are on the way to heaven. I don't know. I, I'm not the judge. I, but I'm not on the way to heaven because I'm a preacher. Amen. 
I'm not on my way to heaven because I'm at Mountain View Baptist Church on a Sunday morning. I'm not on my way to heaven because I put money in an offering plate. I'm not on my way to heaven because, because I got dunked in, the, in a baptistry somewhere. I'm on my way to heaven because as a 10-year-old boy, I understood that God manifests his love toward me. God demonstrated his love. He took my place. Amen. He paid my sin debt. Jesus Amen. loves me. Yes. The kids sing it. Jesus loves me. I won't sing it. If I started singing, you'd get up, walk out. It's that bad. Jesus but, but Jesus does love us. Jesus does love us. He loves us so much, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. I, I, the, the word here in this passage of scripture in 1 John 4 is he became our propitiation. I have no idea what that means. You've got a smart pastor. Ask him what that means. What does that mean, Pastor? No, I'm not. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's awfully hard when you're put on the spot like that to answer a question. Propitiation. Literally, it means God took my place. Yes. He became my substitute. Yes. Well, I have two daughters. I love telling the story, and I, I'll probably stop. I have more points I want to give, but I, I love telling the story. My daughters, my oldest daughter, her name is Angel. Mm. We literally named her Angel. And... Uh, I don't think she really likes her name still to this day. And uh, she got made fun of by her classmates. One of her friends in school nicknamed her Lucy, short for Lucifer, you know, the fallen angel. <laughs> and uh, so not bullies in school, you know, that's what it is. And, uh, but Angel, she's, she's 26 now. She actually she gets married in, in, in under, under three weeks or under four weeks, excuse me. And uh, so she's about to get married, 26 years old. She's excited about all I'm excited she's going to get married because... Someone else is going to start paying her bills. I'm thrilled about that. <laughs> thrilled about that. And uh, she's, she's about to get married. And, and uh, my youngest daughter, her name is Gabrielle, and uh, we call her Gabby. Gabby is 23. She's already married. She's a nurse. She lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, her husband's a firefighter. My, my daughter's fiancé, the other one is getting married. Her husband's a, or future husband's a firefighter. So I've got two potential firefighter son-in-laws, and, uh, which means I'm just going to go around behind them and set in fires just to keep them busy. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I, I'm just joking. I shouldn't joke like that. But, uh, but I, I, I'm excited they're getting married. When they were little, my, my daughter, Angel, she's addicted to chocolate. I mean, my daughter loves chocolate. Angel, she loves chocolate. I, she, if she goes to Baskin Robbins or Dairy Queen or something, she's getting a chocolate-based ice cream with chocolate on top of it and chocolate chips on it and chocolate syrup on top of that. And I mean, it's like a brownie in the middle of it. It's, it's death by chocolate for her all the time. To the point where my wife would go shopping and she'd buy some chocolate chip morsels. And my wife's like OCD on organization. She, you know, in the pantry, she's got, she goes shopping and she takes stuff out of the packages and puts them in these Tupperware containers that are see-through, that stack nice and neat. And, and they're see-through, but she still labels the front of them. And, you know, she, and so there's chocolate chips. You can see their chocolate chips. And everybody says chocolate chips on the front in case I couldn't see that they were chocolate chips. I mean, that's how organized she is. It's amazing. It really is. My daughter, at five years old, six years old, seven years old, she'd go into the pantry. And Angel, she'd reach up, and she'd sneak in there, reach up there, and she'd grab the chocolate chip container. She'd pull it out, and she'd go run into her bedroom. And she'd open that chocolate chip container, and it was like... <laughs> she'd pour, I mean, chocolate down her face. She's, she'd eat, and, and she'd eat the entire contents of that container. A whole bag of Nestle morsel chocolate chips in there. She, they're gone. My daughter ate them all. And my daughter wasn't real smart. She, she would take that chocolate chip container and she would, she'd hide it in her bedroom. She wouldn't take it back. She wouldn't leave a little bit in there like you think, oh, I guess I used those somehow. No, she'd eat the whole thing and she'd hide it. So one day she was in her room. She was making her bed and I walked by and I saw her. She's in there. I thought, well, I'll help her make her bed. I hollered in and said, Angel, you want me to help you make your bed? And Angel's like, sure, Dad, come on in. She's six, seven years old. Dad, come on in. I walked into her room and for me to make a bed, I, I, I like to tuck the sheets in and get it all nice and, and tight and looking sharp. And, and uh, she didn't. She was just kind of throwing the covers over there. And so I reached out and I grabbed the end of the bed and I pulled the bed out away from the wall. Well, when I pulled the bed out away from the wall, I heard clunk. I looked over there and sure enough, there's that empty chocolate chip container. I'm like, that good for nothing, little girl. What has she done now? 
But I played it cool. Dads, you know how cool we are as dads. Yeah, we're cool dads. And so I played this cool. I didn't say anything about it. I just helped her make the bed, finished making the bed, and I pushed the bed back against the wall. And then I walked to the kitchen. I opened the pantry door and <clears throat> got on my loud voice. <clears throat> and I said, Christy, my wife, do you know where the chocolate chips are at? I mean, good and loud. I wanted neighbors three doors down heard me saying, Christy, where are the chocolate chips? And, and uh, my wife's like, honey, they're in the pantry. They're on the third row from the left, second one up. They say chocolate chips on the front of the container. I'm like, honey, I can't find them. And she's like, men. Do I have to do everything for this husband of mine? She came around the corner. I'm like, shh. And, and, and so she came around. She knew I was doing it on purpose now. And she's like, oh, no, I don't know where they're at. And I said, Gabby, youngest daughter, Gabby, do you know where the chocolate chips are at? I'm making sure everyone's hearing me. And Gabby's like, no, Daddy. Daddy, I don't. Dad, ask Angel. We all know Angel's the one who loves chocolate. Nothing like throwing your sibling under the bus, right? Dad, ask Angel. And so I said, Angel. Have you seen the chocolate chips? And there was no answer. I'm like, Angel! I know she can hear me. Angel, do you know where the chocolate chips are at? Her sister's throwing her door open. Angel, we all know you like the chocolate chips. Answer, Dad. You know you had them. The angel, still no answer. I walk to her room. I'm walking in there. Angel. Have you seen the chocolate chips? And my little seven, six, seven-year-old daughter looks up at me and says, no, Dad. I'm like, oh. And as a dad, I'm trying to give her every out in the world. Angel, come on. You know, we know, mama knows, sister knows, every, God knows, everyone knows you love the chocolate chips. You've done this before. Angel, did you take the chocolate chips? No, Dad. I didn't take the chocolate chips. Angel, please tell the truth. Did you take the chocolate? No, Dad. I reached over to the end of the bed. I pulled the bed back out away from the wall. And before I ever pulled the bed away from the wall, she's, oh, Dad, I'm sorry. Dad, it was me. I took the chocolate chips. I'm so sorry. Oh, now she's, she knows she's been had. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, Angel, why didn't you tell the truth? You didn't have to lie. You did wrong. We had rules in our house. I know you guys don't have any rules in your house. <laughs> we had rules in our house that if you did wrong, you paid the price for doing wrong. We, got, we practiced biblical discipline. We didn't abuse our children. We practiced biblical discipline. I said, Angel, you did wrong. That means you get a spanking. Dad, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. But I, we had another rule. If you lied to cover up doing wrong, you got two spankings. Dad, do I have to have two spankings? Dad, I'm so sorry. I, I don't want two spankings. Dad, please don't. Angel, did you do wrong? Yes, sir. Do you deserve a spanking? Yes, sir. Angel, did you lie? Yes, sir. Do you deserve two spankings? Yes, sir. Okay. I closed the door, and she laid over the bed, and I gave her her first little spanking. She's crying. You ever had one of those cries? That you couldn't talk, you know, you're <laughs> slobber coming out, crying, snot. I mean, it's just a mess. She's like, Dad, can, 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 can we take, just take a break? Before I get my second, you'd have thought that I killed the girl. I mean, it was just a little tiny spanking. She would argue with me on that one, but it was just a little tiny spanking. It was nothing like what I got when I was a kid, that's for sure. <laughs> Dad, can we tell you? About that time, there was a little knock on the door. And I knew because the knock, the way it sounded, I knew it wasn't my wife. So I knew it had to be Gabby, her little sister, who's four. So I said, Gabby, your daddy and your sister are busy in here. 
Give us a few minutes. A few moments later, another knock on the door, and it's got my, <clears throat> my dad voice on again. Gabrielle, your dad and your sister are busy. Please leave us alone. We're busy in here. A few moments later, now I'm thinking, mm, two for one special today. <laughs> Both daughters going to get a whooping today. And so now maybe, and, and forgive me, but maybe just a little frustrated as a dad. I walked over to the door and I grabbed the door handle and I opened the door probably a little faster than I should have. And I said, Gabrielle. And I looked in Gabby's eyes as I was getting ready to rebuke her. And my little four-year-old daughter's crying. And I looked down at Gabby and said, Gabby, are you okay? And my little four-year-old daughter said, Daddy, I know Angel did wrong. I know she deserved her spanking for taking the chocolate. She's crying, little four-year-old girl crying. She said, Daddy, I know that Angel lied to cover it up too. And she deserves a second spanking. My four-year-old little girl said, Daddy, would it be okay if I took my, little, my, my sister's second spanking for her? Forgive me. I didn't say any of this out loud, but my brain's starting to roll now. I looked at my little four-year-old daughter in my brain. I didn't say it out loud, but I said, whose child are you? <laughs> what idiot takes their sibling spanking? I was that kid growing up. I was like, mom, dad, hit them more. I'm cheering them on. Go, mom, go. Give them another spanking. That's awesome. And my little four-year-old daughter looks at me and says, can I take her spanking for her? I'm like, you're not my child. There's, I dropped you on your head. There's something wrong with you. This just isn't right. My little four-year-old daughter said, Daddy, can I take her second spanking? They didn't teach they didn't teach us, Brother Miller, in Bible college how to handle a situation like that. There's no parenting class that says, if your sibling, or if your child wants to take their sibling spanking, here's how you handle that. There's no class like that. My wife came around the corner behind my daughter, my little four-year-old daughter. My wife's crying. Like, this child's just like me. She's so sweet. That child's just like you. She didn't say that, but I know she's thinking it. <laughs> my, my wife's crying. Gabby, my little four-year-old, she's crying. I'm crying. I'm thinking, what do you do? I look over at Angel, the seven-year-old who deserves the second spanking. She's still <laughs> crying, but now it's like, yes! Thank you, Jesus! This is wonderful! I didn't know what to do. I literally, by the way, talk to me later. You tell me what I should have done because I don't know what I should have done. I looked, at, I looked at my wife. She said, I don't know. I look at Gabby. She's crying. I'll take her spanking for her. I look at Angel. I said, Angel, do you hear what your sister said? She's like, yes. <laughs> do you want your sister to take your second spanking? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. I, I didn't know what to do. So I looked at Angel, who deserved the second spank, and I said, Angel, you step right over here. You're not leaving the room. You're going to stand right beside your sister. I said, Gabby, come here. And I took my little four-year-old. I'm embarrassed to say it. I took my little four-year-old daughter. I laid her over the bed, and she got the spanking. That her big sister deserved. I remember I, my little four year old girl, she stood up from that spanking, crying. She looked into my eyes, I'm crying. I look at my wife, she's crying. My little four year old daughter, who got a spanking she didn't deserve, 
My little four-year-old daughter ran up to me and threw her arms around me. Said, Daddy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. I just gave her a spanking. She didn't deserve. Daddy, I love you. My wife came over. She threw her arms around. We're all snotting and crying and boo-hooing. My, my angel, seven-year-old, she's still, she said, yes, thank you. She's throwing her, I love you all. You're one. I, we, had a, we had just a crying fit. You know what it was? Picture what Jesus Christ did for you and what Jesus Christ did for me. It's a very small picture, but it's a picture. Amen. When God Almighty looked down over the, the, the portals of heaven and he, he looked down here in Holyoke, Massachusetts to, 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 to us and he says, they're a sinner. They deserve the wrath of God. They deserve my judgment on their life. Amen. And Jesus Christ says, Father, I'll take their place. Amen. And Jesus Christ stretched out his arms on the cross of Calvary mm. and willingly took my punishment mm. and your punishment. Mm. Because Jesus Amen. was not a sinner. Jesus had not sinned, but I have. Amen. And Jesus took my place. Yes, he did. Jesus took your place. Yes, he Talk did. about the love of of God. Those times I feel all alone. Those times I feel like there's no one there that cares. Those times where it seems like I can't press on. Those times where it feels like it's not worth trying. Hey, can I tell you today, I want you to understand with every ounce of my being, you are loved by God Almighty. He loves you so. He says this, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, one of my favorite verses on assurance. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. And here's what he says. For, I have said, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm never alone. Why? Because God loves me. Amen. Hey, if you're here today, you're not sure of the love of Christ in your life. Oh, let me reassure you. That book we just read from in 1 John, the entire book is a love story of God to you and me. Amen. I still have love notes saved. My time's up. I have, I have two more points. I'm not going to get to them. I may save them for tonight. I may change it for tonight. I don't know. I, when we were in college, I, I finally noticed my wife. Finally. We went to high school together and I didn't really notice her there, and we went to college, and I was dating other girls, I guess. And uh, anyway, it's Bible college, so a date was going to church with them. That's what, really what it was. And, uh, but I, I remember when I finally noticed her, she noticed me, and we began a relationship together. I remember the first time I leaned over to tell Christy that I love her. We were on a date. She'll tell the story different. Don't believe her. She's wrong. I, I remember this very clearly. It was very traumatic for me. And uh, we were on a date. We were in the back seat of our family vehicle. My mom was the chaperone in the front seat driving the vehicle. And uh, we were in college. I was a junior in college. My mom was the chaperone. I was a junior in college, and my mom was the chaperone. <laughs> Tells you a lot, doesn't it? And uh, she was a sophomore. I remember I, I sweaty hands. My hands are sweaty. My sweaty palms. I leaned over towards Christy. By the way, don't do this. But I leaned over towards her, and not yet anyway. I leaned over and got that, you know, that cool look. I'm trying to get one going, and I don't have it anymore. I lost it long ago. She had that glistening in her eyes, that beautiful smile. She's looking at me. It was almost like I was going in for a kiss, but I knew better than to do that. And she'd have beat me if I'd done that. But I leaned in close and I said, Christy, I love you. You know, the angels were singing. Birds were tweeting. It was just amazing. She looked back over at me and I thought, here, she's, she's going to kiss me. I got to get ready. She didn't. 
<laughs> and then she said, thank you. <laughs> I would like to say I'd forget that. Not, I'm never going to forget that. Talk about traumatic. That's not what you say when someone says they love you, right? Someone says they love you. The response is, I love you too. Ah, it was six months later. It was brutal. For months, I was like, she doesn't love me. She doesn't love me. What's going on? I wrote her notes. Do you love me? Circle yes or no. She did, she'd tear them up and throw them away. It's brutal. Hey, can I tell you? There's a God in heaven who this book he wrote to you and the whole emphasis of this book he wrote to you is this. I love you. I love you. I love you. And no matter what trial you face in your life, no, no matter what problem there is, no matter what medical diagnosis you face, no matter what bill you get in the mail, no matter who forsakes you, who leaves you, what friend back talks you, no matter what name, no matter how many grades in school you have to repeat, God loves you. He loves you so much he sent his son to die for you. He took your place. Have you experienced the love of Christ? If, if your life were to end this week, oh boy, I pray that's not the case. That's not my personality. I'm not a doomsday person. But if your life were to end this week, mine could. Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? If you took your last breath this week, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for a Christian. If I take my last breath this week, I know I'm going to see Jesus face to face. And my wife last week made me up my life insurance policy. So she, is that what you told me? No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I know I'm going to see Jesus face to face. Not because I'm a preacher. Not because I'm a church member, not because I give money, not because, of, not because of, the Bible says, not by any works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, let's say man should boast. What's that mean? I can't earn my way to heaven, so the only way I get to go to heaven is through Jesus, John chapter 14, verse 6. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. No man cometh to the Father but by him. That's it. Hold on, church family. Are you going to heaven? Jesus loves you so much he died for you. Come back tonight, maybe get part two of the message. Because it doesn't end there. But do you know Jesus this morning? As I close, I'm going to pray. Can I just ask you this? Many of you probably already know you're saved. You've got a great church. You've been taught right. Many of you probably already know you're saved. Could I ask you then, what about your family member? What about your neighbor? You say, well, I've got my fire insurance. I know I'm going to heaven. Great. But what about that neighbor? What about that classmate at school? What about the person down the road? Do you care enough to share Jesus with them? Seriously. It's one thing for us to know we're going to heaven, but do we care enough to tell a lost and dying world? It was prayed this morning for the offering prayer. The mission field's right out there. Do we care enough to go tell others? I'm going to pray to close the service. As I pray, the, the, the invitation's twofold. If you're here today and you don't know for sure you're on your way to heaven, you're in the right place. We'd love to take a Bible today you got an amazing pastor and pastor's wife. They'd love to take a Bible today and show you from the Bible what it means to be a Christian. Would you let us take a Bible today and help you? you say, I'm not coming to join the church. Good, because that's not what it's about. I, I'm not. I, you, you, it's all about what does God say? What does this book say how to go to heaven? Yep. And we'll open the Bible and we'll show you from the Bible what being a Christian is all about. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, you can know that today. If you're here today and you do know you're saved, could I invite you to pray for that family member or that friend, that coworker, that classmate? Do you care enough to share Jesus with them? I'm going to pray. After I pray, the instruments will play. 
we may sing. I don't know. I, I should have asked you ahead of time. But when that happens, we'll all stand to our feet. And I invite you this morning, Christian, would you pray for that lost friend, lost loved one? I invite you to come to this old-fashioned altar and kneel and pray. You say, can I pray for my seat? Sure you can. There's something special about going to an old-fashioned altar, talking to God there. And by the way, Christian, it may be you stepping out that helps someone else who may not know they're saved to step out too. If you're here today and you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, please let us take a Bible and show you. When the piano or the instruments play, why don't you step out too? Pastor will be down here. We'll be down here. We'd love to talk to you and show you in five minutes, show you from the Word of God what it means to be a Christian. Would you let us help you? Let's pray together. Lord, I love you this morning. <clears throat> God, I'm so thankful for your goodness to each of us. God, thank you that you love us. Lord, I don't know the burdens that anyone in this auditorium is bearing today. I don't know the troubles. I don't know the problems. I don't know the bills. I don't know the attacks. I don't know the medical diagnosis. I don't, I don't know any of the problems. But God, you do. And God, you love us. Your word says cast, for us to cast all of our care upon you because you care for us. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you, God, that you became our propitiation, our substitute. You paid our sin debt. God, thank you for that. Lord, if there's someone here today in this church service that doesn't know you as their Savior, maybe, maybe watching online, I, I don't know. Lord, someone that doesn't know you as their Savior, may today be the day of salvation in their life. Lord, give them the courage to step out. Lord, help us to be able to take the Bible and show them from the Bible what it means to be a Christian. And may, may today be the day of salvation for them. Lord, I pray for the Christians here today, those that know you as their Savior. Lord, may you give us a burden for the lost, for those, those friends, those family members around us that don't know you as their Savior. Lord, help us to have a burden for them. May today be a day where we pray specifically for that person. Lord, bring them to our heart, bring them to our mind, and help us to care enough to pray for them today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, the organ's already playing. Can we just stand to our feet here this morning as we close the service? And as, as the organ plays, hey, Christian, would you, would you find a spot to pray for that lost loved one? Would you, would you step out, Christian? Would you find a spot to pray? God bless you. Lord, I, I pray for my aunt. I pray for my uncle. I pray for my cousin. I pray for that co-worker. I pray for that classmate. Would you just pray for that lost friend, that lost loved one? Would you care enough to pray for them today? If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, if that's you, oh, would you let us take a Bible and show you from the Bible what it means to be a Christian. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He wants you in heaven. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus loves you. He died for you. Would you let us take a Bible and show you from the Bible what it means to be a Christian? pastors down here. Maybe after the service, you'd catch one of us and shake our hand and just say, I want to know more about heaven. We'd love to talk to you about that. We'd love to talk to you about it. Folks are praying. You take as much time as you need. In just a moment, pastor will come. He'll close the service. But the invitation's still for you. The invitation's still for you. If God's spoken to your heart, let us help you so you can know you're on your way to heaven. just someone to talk to. We'd love to talk to you. We have people standing by that would take God's word and just show you some verses to, to, to help you. Maybe you would just like someone to pray with. Maybe you would just like some encouragement this morning. We'd love to pray with you. But if, if you're at your seat this morning, let's just talk to the Lord. Ask God to put someone on our hearts, on our minds. Just think about the love of God.
God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, brother, for being with us this morning and sharing your heart. And uh, you got to come back tonight to hear the second part. And so I hope you can be with us this evening. 6 p.m. is our evening service. We do have our choir practice at 5. I didn't get to recognize that there are any guests here earlier. So if you're a first-time guest, we'd love to meet you in the back. My wife and I will be in the back, and we have a special gift for you. Please take some of these. We have a big stack of these in the back. These are our Easter invites. And then bring someone with you next week to church. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Again, thank you so much for being with us. Brother Jackson, can you pray for us, please? We're dismissed. Lord in heaven.